Yeah, okay. Um, all right, if you can start out by just uh, introducing yourself to us and, um, you know, where you come from okay. or who you work for. Hi, it's nice to meet you. I'm uh, David Kernahan. I work for JISC in the UK. I'm also an independent, I suppose, analyst on uh, higher education. I uh, write on a couple of uh, blog and news sites, including my own blog site, uh, Follows the Apocalypse. I've had a long-standing interest in open education, and I do like to take a critical perspective where I can. Thank you. Um, so we'd like to ask you, uh, why does open matter for students, faculty, and institutions? Okay. Um, I think open uh, matters much more widely than that. I think open matters for everybody that uh, uses uh, the internet and or wants to access information. For ever since, well, since the beginning of time, information's always uh, been a scarce good. It's uh, 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 been uh, privileged. You have to ask for access. You have to be uh, granted for access and you have to be deemed worthy of access in order to find out information about the uh, way in which the uh, world works around us. Um, I suppose openness came from the spirit of uh, scientific inquiry initially. I mean, science just works much better when things are open. Um, so there was always been calls for people to write academic papers and to share all the details of their experiment, to share their data, to mean that other people can verify the experiment. Um, I mean, this was an argument that the uh, Royal Society in the UK were having back in the 1700s, so this is old, old stuff that the, the uh, more access we have to information and to the conditions around information, the uh, more we can verify information. As the internet uh, uh, developed, I mean, it's a, a perfect platform for replicating information. It uh, uh, makes the storage of uh, millions of copies of a resource not much more difficult than storing one. It uh, makes it possible for uh, millions of people to own their own copy of a resource at uh, no cost. And um, unfortunately, as the internet expanded, a, a lot of people tried to import all the business models onto the web including in uh, many cases institutions and I'm just going to pause for a second while he goes out. Okay. <laughs> I think it's including in many cases institutions, I mean I'm thinking about early web education products like All Learn and uh, Fathom in which it was uh, just another wire of buying access uh, to a course or to uh, published material. But the uh, possibilities of the uh, web for sharing have uh, transcended this. That um, even where information is uh, supposedly uh, scarce, it's still accessible, it's still possible to get it. I mean, you think of stuff like the ICANN has a PDF hashtag where academics are sharing copies largely of their own papers to people that uh, uh, want to read them but can't or are unable to or don't uh, wish to pay £60 to Elsevier or Pearson in order to get access to them. Uh, you see the same thing happening in uh, music, in uh, film. Uh, uh, piracy uh, tends to start where the uh, business models of uh, scarce content are just breaking down and it is possible to see fixes for that I mean services like say uh, Spotify or uh, Apple Music um, they've actually cut uh, piracy because uh, they support access to uh, multiple songs but it's still not open because we have the second big cultural uh, shibboleth it's the idea of uh, people are paid uh, are paid for their work. They're 
paid for uh, what they have done uh, rather than uh, uh, because they're people or because of what they can do. And they need to be paid in order to live. So this, I mean, open, I think, is the first flowering of a much uh, wider critical perspective that will probably lead to something terrifying like the end of waged work and a completely different uh, way of organizing society and opens on the vanguard of that. So for institutions, for academics, for students, you're supposed to be on the uh, cutting edge of the cultural movements that are happening in society. And I think open is a perfect example of that. And I guess, <laughs> I mean, that was very large scale. Um, perhaps this is too near of a question, but <laughs> uh, should open be a default at universities? Why do you think so or why not? Um, I think that open uh, does need to be a default at uh, universities. I think that the days of uh, restricting access uh, to information I think they're finished. I think that apart from information linked to uh, personal activities and uh, privacy, that there's no longer really a, a reason to, pr to pretend information is scarce actually when it's abundant. Um, this, however, has to be uh, coupled with a, um, a, w a way of supporting academic staff, a way of making sure that it's still possible to actually make a living or uh, to exist as a human being whilst being an academic. Okay, cool. And um, how, can, how do you think we can um, encourage open access to engage our faculty, students, and um, people at these institutions to be open to this kind of... Um, there's a lot of theories of change around this and there are different answers depending on how cynical you are feeling. The uh, a worst one I think I've uh, uh, heard, which I will uh, repeat here as a quotation, not my actual view, is that we just need to wait for them to die. That um, the younger academics, they get this. They're sharing stuff. They've been uh, growing up sharing stuff. They get the way this works. And the older academics, are uh, 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 more set in the uh, patterns of old-fashioned uh, publication and of uh, publication as an achievement, as something that you should be proud that you've been published. Uh, younger academics, I think, see uh, publication as just something that you do. Um, but as I say, that is terribly cynical. Um, I think that the uh, benefits of open are starting to be to to become uh, uh, more and more apparent in terms of practice, that the questions come when openness appears to be affecting uh, people's uh, livelihoods, uh, people's practice, uh, people's jobs, that the uh, big barrier the open agenda has to overcome is not any um, facet of openness itself. It's the uh, way it interacts with uh, systems of uh, uh, prestige, power, and money. So addressing those issues, I think, is key. I mean, you're making me think that um, wouldn't, and everyone likes a big audience if you want to share something. Mm, yeah. So isn't that a benefit? Um, I mean, audience highs, I mean, it's been shown in uh, numerous studies after study after study. If you uh, release an academic research paper and it's openly licensed, uh, more people will read it, lots more, an order of magnitude more will read it. That makes you more likely to be cited. That makes you more likely to be invited to uh, collaborations, to conferences like Open Ed, because people can read your stuff and they can see what you're doing. I mean, I was invited to uh, deliver a keynote at Open Ed in uh, 2013, and I was hugely flattered to be asked. I was asked because of the uh, 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 material I was publishing myself openly 
on my personal blog. It had nothing at all to do with the work I was paid to do. It had everything to do uh, with the uh, work I was doing because I wanted it to do. And that, I think, that, uh, uh, personally, that was a big uh, changing point. It's like, okay, this stuff that I'm uh, just doing because I'm interested in it, because I like writing, because I like to make sense of stuff, because I like to share things. That's actually uh, uh, been much more beneficial to my personal career than a lot of the stuff that I've uh, done as a paid policy officer or a, um, a program manager or anything like that. I mean, that's not uh, 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 not to say I've not done some amazing things in those roles and I've uh, had amazing opportunities, but in terms of what's actually shaped the way that I live my life, it's been open publishing. And maybe lastly, um, anything here that you've seen, learned about that really surprised you or sparked an interest? This is a weird conference this year. It's like it's uh, two conferences that are superimposed. You've got um, a stream of the conference that's all about open textbooks, that's all about uh, demonstrating open texts are as good as paid for texts, and that they can replace open uh, 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 texts, and you can, and also uh, link to that the agenda around, around analytics. But there's also been a really prominent uh, critical strand, uh, people looking uh, critically as openness, uh, saying, okay, is openness an analog good? Is it something that is just the best possible answer under every circumstance? Is it something that we've not actually properly critiqued. And I found that really excited. I mean, I'm uh, uh, looking forward to uh, Roland Moe's uh, presentation after lunch uh, today. Um, I loved Amy Collier's stuff this morning. That was absolutely fantastic. Uh, Paul Stacey on business models was really interesting as uh, well. I mean, he's uh, 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 just such an amazing person, and he's uh, really taken a critical look at open business models. And I got a lot from that. Uh, so yeah, it's been a really interesting uh, conference. Uh, uh, lots of arguments, I always like that in a conference. I think a really good academic conference should have at least uh, one session that you can sit in and think, I completely disagree with everything in this session, including basic underlying premise. And that's always a lovely experience, so I had a couple of them too. Thank you so much for talking to us. No, thank you very much. I hope that's useful or interesting.